Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to episode 36 of Valleys of Numenor. We're up to episode 4 of the second season of Foundation. We've been introduced to two major characters who will have the fate of the Foundation in their hands. What will their parts be in Harry Seldon's plan? Let's see what's in store. Episode 36, Foundation 0204, where the stars are scattered thinly. Mark Tondurai is in the director's chair this time out. He's a longtime TV director. Polly and Constant come out of the jump back to Terminus. Hober Mallow was passed out the whole time, strapped upright, so she wakes him up. He was actually once a cleric himself until he showed he wasn't exactly able to stay on the straight and narrow. He tries to figure out what her real name is. It can't be Constant. If he does, he'll share his rare bottle of wine with her. On Terminus, the director there is met with the new arrivals, and it turns out he knows Mallow personally. After pleasantries are exchanged for around two seconds, they head to the vault. On Trantor, Sarath gets herself undolled up, getting herself ready to go without makeup as she prepares for a walk with Brother Dawn, and trying to dig around to figure out what really happened to her family. The young Cleon points her towards the secluded area of the garden. I mean, after all, they're the same man. But tells her not to worry, her chaperone will be with them. Once there, she comes right out and asks him if he thinks Day had them killed. He says no, but seems willing to believe it's possible. So awfully suspicious, everyone who wouldn't have made the alliance with Trantor was wiped out, leaving her with little to no choice. Even if he doesn't think it was possible, she asks Dawn if he thinks he would be able to do it. Says no again, but maybe under the right circumstances he would. But before he knew her, of course. She then puts out the idea of actually marrying him, because, like we said, after all, they're the same man. Inside at the huge mural, Sarath's assistant Rue is admiring the newer portions of it when Dusk mentions he's been fixing up the old ones as well, thanks to the new paint. Turns out she was one of those women who spent time with the emperors and had their minds wiped. But only partially, she still has an idea she was one of them, since the fact she was helped launch her political career, as it were. She's aware no one really wants this marriage to take place outside of day, maybe possibly the queen, for her own reasons. Dusk mentions they could talk about it in his room while watching their time together. Oh, the legacy of Tommy, Pam, Paris, and Kim. The Imperial ship arrives at Suena, and General Rios and Gladen are going down to the surface the hard way. They'll basically fall down and find the informant that way with their extraction packet going first. They're dropped down and their glider wings pop open, then suddenly the coyote runs into a cliff. Oops, wrong show. They land safely, but their packet is lost and moving. The locals have stumbled on it and are taking it back to town. The two soldiers find the caravan and the packet. They toss away their weapons in good faith, but the gang wants to negotiate with Lord Humungus for more gas. I mean, with the Imperials. Negotiations don't go well, and knives and guns start flashing. Needless to say, the locals aren't much of a match, except the one guy who figures out it's better to run now. The old Bel Rios probably wouldn't have let the firefight happen. Post-prison, he's more game for it. At the vault, Hober is amazed to see his name pasted up there, as well as the guy's burned remains on the ground. He tries to leave, but the vault pulls him right in. While Polly and the director argue, Constant goes in to find him. Polly follows, and it's that shadowy place we saw back in episode one where Harry was walking around. They find Mallow. He says he's been in there for two days, while the cleric's been there for two minutes. They're joined by Director Cermak, who left his aide Sut in charge. The kooky stairs are all over the place. Who knows which way to go? Suddenly, they hear music and decide to head towards it. They reach Selden's library, and guess who's there? Yep, Harry emerges from the darkness. He sees the robe on the clerics and realizes the religious part of the plan has begun, so he blesses Constant. He then recognizes Polly and can't believe it's been that long. Somehow he also knows about Mallow and his travails. All four people there are needed for what Harry has in mind. Back on Sawena, the soldiers reach the house of Deucen Bar. He confronts them outside his door and is prepared to shoot them until he hears the key words, 
where the stars are scattered thinly. Hey, our episode title. Once inside, he fills them in on what's been going on there. He shows them a recording of when Kansa and Polly were there and that they have auras, which only the Emperor was supposed to have. You also hear about the vault and whisper ships sort of descended down from the Evictus. Then the lynch mob arrives. Barr shows the soldiers the back exit and asks to be shot before they come in. The general obliges. The guys make their way out back to the kit and has their version of Scotty do their version of beaming them up. In the vault, Polly notices the Prime Radiant is still there when he knows Salver took it a century and a half ago. Say, where are they this episode? Sir Mac tells Harry he's ready for war, but Selden wants Polly and Constance to go to Trantor to hold off the war as long as possible. Go the old-fashioned way and don't let them know about the jump ships. Sir Mac and Constance leave, and Polly follows after finding out why Jager was burned up. Harry basically tells him it was lightning, fire, wrath of God or something. He asks Hobart to wait. He's got something special for him to do. After hearing his life story, he gives him his own mission, one meant for a skeptic such as himself. On Trantor, one of the guards meets with Sarath and her group in the garden at the secluded place Dawn showed her. Turns out they figured out a way to reverse the memory wipe, so that's why Rue remembers what she did. The guard doesn't know if Cleon ordered the death of her family, but he'll try to find out. She also wants to know how Day was able to survive the assassination attempt. Sounds like someone is upset she didn't get her money's worth. Hmm. Mallow emerges from the vault and tells the clerics he's going someplace different than them. He'll take their ship so Polly gathers up their belongings. Constant seems to have a thought they'd get together and end up doing some not-so-holy things, but... It's not to be, at least not yet. So he leaves, still not able to figure out her name. Even though they're apart, their fates are intertwined. Hey, that's a pretty cool line there. Hmm. So we get more pieces from the original stories here. Cermak and Sut come from the Merchant Princes, and the meeting with Barr is basically the opening scene of the general, only here the ending is way more downbeat. It seems the queen was the one who arranged for the killers to barge into the bedroom there, but if she had him killed, she likely wouldn't know for sure if he was behind the murders of her family. The question will be exactly what Mallow's role will be as Polly and Constant negotiate for peace. Meanwhile, we lost track of a couple characters or three, but that will be remedied next week. Next time, Gal, Salver, and the newly revived Harry Selden actually do go to Ignis and will the three Cleons stick together in the face of adversity? That'll be next time on Valleys of Numenor. Please hit the subscribe button if you like what you're hearing. I'm John Hartjar. Thanks for listening.